Um, my name is Daniel Cavazos. I'm with the city of Austin. Uh, I actually work on the cooling tower program here. I administer the cooling tower program for the city of Austin. I really wish that we would have had AWE's information when we began this. Uh, there really wasn't a lot of information that was out there. So we were actually creating a program from scratch. And so there were a lot of uh, lessons learned along the way. And what I wanna do during this presentation is to go over some of those kind of bumps in the road that we hit, how we overcome them, some um, uh, things that we're planning to implement uh, that actually makes this I want to say this program is successful and we got a little more out of it than what we were expecting when the program was being uh, was being conceptualized and launched so. Go ahead. So. Um, the Water Conservation Compliance Group, which uh, where you're going to find the cooling tower efficiency program within the city of Austin, is actually one of four of our compliance groups with our car wash efficiency, our commercial facility irrigation assessment, and our residential uh, irrigation compliance program. Uh, a little bit about the background for this uh, cooling tower efficiency program, I call it CTEP for short. Uh, we had already dealt with a lot of the low hanging fruit uh, when it came to finding, um, uh, you know, uh, or implementing programs for water efficiencies. We had dealt with fixtures, we were looking, we had dealt with toilets uh, and those things. Uh, and so uh, we decided to branch out and try to find some other water that was out there. And what we settled on was uh, commercial, industrial, and institution high water usage. In, a 2013, uh, in 2013, there was a NU study of CII water that identified cooling towers as having the greatest potential uh, for water savings. Uh, cooling towers account for 20 to 30% or more of the facility's total annual water use. And what we actually found out is that uh, that's, it, it's not the same across the board. Um, there's actually a lot more out there. Uh, well, no, let me, let me re restate that. Uh, it's not the same for each building. Uh, we really found that out here recently as we were doing our own internal studies uh, about uh, comparing the different buildings and it helps us to identify areas that we need to focus on. When we began the program though, and getting back to its conceptualization, when we began the program, we were looking at uh, 100 million gallons per year uh, of water savings. That was enough to serve uh, 1,500 households and save approximately 1.6 million uh, per year in water and wastewater charges. That's what we were hoping for. Uh, so when the program began January 1st of 2008, the cooling tower standards were introduced. Uh, they were adopted and became effective January the 1st. In September 6th of 2017, Austin City Council approved the mandatory registration annual inspection requirements as part of our local amendments to the Uniform Mechanical Code and the Uniform Plumbing Code. Let me make sure I'm not going too fast here. In 2020, just this last year, uh, Austin City Council approved administrative fines to ensure compliance to the cooling tower efficiency program requirements. Up to this point, it was just a rebate and incentive program. Last year, it became a compliance program and it was folded into our compliance group. And that's when I came on board and started working with it. When we began, uh, when we began the actual program, it launched, um, uh, we had about 293 cooling towers or 293 properties that, uh, that registered initially we were thinking that there were about 400 uh, within the city. Again, we didn't have AWE's forecasting tools or any of those things. Uh, the way that we actually went about finding these cooling towers was working in-house 
with our own group, uh, specifically with our backflow prevention department, uh, because the backflow prevention department had to uh, do inspections or it, it's uh, required that they inspect those backflow prevention devices, uh, we were able to identify a good amount of cooling towers within our city. Uh, they're listed as either high or low priority. Sometimes they'll say chillers were attached to it. Uh, other times cooling towers. Uh, we sent out a blanket um, uh, grouping of letters. Uh, you know, we blanketed the city uh, from these uh, ones we felt comfortable that they were actually cooling towers uh, and hoping to get a response. Uh, not only did we just, not only did we let them know that there was a requirement for them to, uh, to to register and uh, their cooling towers, but we also sent a does not apply form along with it, just in case we uh, in our wide net captured some properties that uh, you know didn't meet the requirement. They could fill it out, send it in, would take it off of our uh, off of our list. Um, once we actually sent out their first uh, batch, uh, we had the, the 293. Uh, after that, it began to fall off, as you can see. Uh, the next year, we had 203 uh, inspections that were sent. Uh, the year after that, even less. Uh, our lowest period was in 2019. And then uh, the program was turned over to the compliance group kind of in the middle of the inspection cycle for 2020. Uh, and at this point, actually something does change here. Not only does it become a compliance program and we send out letters letting them know that now this is uh, a compliance program and that there are, um, or we've been uh, permitted to, to um, uh, fine if you're non-compliant to the program. But we also began looking at how we were um, actually going about finding the people uh, in the uh, in the wild. That's how I like to look at it. We're trying to find cooling towers in the wild, and so we started to, to kind of peel back the onions or the layers of our program a little bit. We found out that we were not as effective as we could have been in reaching people in our city. We were sending our letters to the um, uh, to the property address, um, but that didn't mean that it was getting to the people that it really needed to see the information. And so we began to really go through uh, individually uh, each one of the properties to determine: Are we sending it to the account holder? Are we sending it to the uh, building management company? Uh, uh, you know, and, and really trying to identify that the proper person was getting the information in their hands. And we realized that it started going up after that. And so we went from uh, the initial uh, 293 uh, registrations uh, to this last year, we had 308 that sent information in. We actually began to turn around and to increase. One other thing that I want to show you is the orange on the from 2020 2021 we actually had 53 new properties that began submitting their information. Um, remember I told you we also sent out those does not apply where because we sent out we had a, such a wide net we didn't really know if there were cooling towers there and we began getting people who are submitting information saying please take us off your list we don't have a cooling tower here. Even as we were getting people coming off the list, we were getting people added to the list because we began uh, we began reaching more and more people. So it's kind of like one out, one in, the, and the program has remained steady uh, this whole time as uh, it it really continues to grow. Uh, if you look at 2021 on the percentage response, we have a 69% response. Uh, and actually on this, we now know that about 30% of our percentage response, about 30%, they have cooling towers and uh, we just didn't receive any information from them. They didn't, they didn't submit their annual inspection as they were, as they're obligated to do. Uh, and so that's different than the 2016, 2017. I don't want to confuse you here because the 68% um, a response there that was from groups that we didn't even know if they really had cooling towers we just had a list that we built 
we got information back from 68% of them. The other 30% or so, we were really, okay, maybe they do, maybe they don't, and they're just kind of um, setting the, our information aside. We've been able to really tighten up on our information and to get uh, a better handle on the program and to get an understanding of the, um, of the cooling towers that are out there. Uh, just to give you a little information about our program, uh, program requirements, December of last year, our existing requirements were added to the water conservation ordinance. Those requirements are like five cycles of concentration. Uh, they have to have some, there's mechanical requirements like the overflow sensors and alarms, which are connected to the building and central energy management, makeup and blowdown meters, conductivity controllers. Some of the items that we've also added was treatment to minimize the growth of Legionella and other microorganisms. They have to use a biocide and they cannot operate a cooling tower in a manner that uh, allows an overflow from the basin. That's new as well. There's an inspection component. Uh, cooling towers must conduct annual inspections. The reports due by March 1st, we're kind of in the middle of our reporting cycle right now. Uh, the reporting period begins from December 1st through March the 1st. And uh, they use an outside, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a third party um, individual who will conduct the inspection. They fill out our form and it's submitted to us at uh, Austin Water Conservation Division. Now, all of that's great. All of that is really great. But what we've really learned over the last few years is that you have to make a business case. Uh, because even though you have a compliance program and you're, you're uh, continually you know, sending information to these properties, letting them know that, uh, that uh, we need your information, we need your information, a lot of people are just going to sit on it or it gets put to the side. Uh, you do what you can to try to make your, your, your mailings and your information uh, noticeable. But what I found is that the best thing that you can do is make a business case. And so we really changed the way that we communicate uh, this program to get them to understand um, that this is beneficial to them. This isn't just something where it's a, um, uh, it's not just a program that you need to comply with, but there are actually really good benefits to you. And so when we, when we began the program back in 26, 2017, uh, and the first round of uh, inspections were received, the average cycle of concentration was 3.5 cycles of concentration. A cycle of concentration is the water usage that's going through the cooling tower before you need to release that water and introduce new water. Uh, a, a cooling tower uses a lot of water, uh, anywhere in the areas of 19,000 gallons or 19, yeah, 19,000 uh, gallons and greater. It's, it's a significant amount of water. I'll go over some of that here in a moment. Uh, so if you can increase the cycles of concentration, you lower the amount of water used. Not only do you lower the amount of water used, but they lower their bills as well. And so we began to talk to them about moving from three cycles of concentration to six cycles of concentration. You use 20% less water, which again, that's just water going, that's not only water going down the drain, but that's money going down the drain. And so when we began to actually, you know, speak in these terms, that gets attention. That begins to, well, 20% of our, uh, our, you know, the budget towards this side of things, uh, that's, that's pretty significant, especially when you're talking about office buildings, because with office buildings, your cooling tower water usage is about 60% of their water usage. 60% of an office building's water usage, and you're saying that I can decrease my amount by 20% if I go from three to six, that's significant savings. That starts to get people's attention, and that's much more um, attention, that's a much more of an attention getter than the letter that we're sending out to them. Okay, so, you know, we did have to change the way that we were talking uh, with them. We use a stick and a carrot approach. Of course, the stick is going to be the enforcement side of our program, but the carrot is the actual and potential water and money savings from the program. We use both sides of things as we're communicating with them uh, so that we could try to kind of do more to, to not only gain compliance, but to uh, increase the water efficiencies from this program. One other thing that we have to talk to them about, 
because uh, as the, is his name Brian? Brian, is his name Brian? Brad, Brad, I'm sorry. As Brad was saying that a lot of people don't understand these things. And so we really have to go in and talk to them about, uh, you know, can you run your cooling tower at five to six cycles of concentration? Because that's what the, the, the requirements are. It has to go, it has to, um, you know, meet the five cycles of concentration. And so we talk to them, we give them um, uh, this information, Austin Water, uh, when you look at the, uh, the water parameters uh, and then the maximum values, we get the maximum value, values from ASHRAE 189.1, the standard for, uh, standard for the design of high performance green buildings. We compare those two and what we come up with is that with conductivity, you can run your cooling tower, this is just with Austin Water, at 9.82 cycles of concentration. Um, of course, you you have to look at all the limits with our sulfates, it's at 6.41. So you can actually run the cooling tower, and this is without any additional equipment, uh, any uh, other um, um, item that needs to be added, with just Austin water, you can achieve six cycles of concentration. And so, you know, during conversations, and uh, as we're approaching the cooling tower community, giving them this information, we don't really have to do anything, and we can we can actually save 20% of our water if we just adjust the cycles of concentration. And then once again, we start seeing improvements. We start seeing more people come into compliance. So some program challenges. Um, finding cooling towers in the wild. That is still our, our main challenge. Uh, how do we find those cooling towers in the wild? Because even if we have a uh, location that's been identified, whether it is a uh, commercial, industrial uh, uh, building, uh, we, don't, we don't necessarily know who is the person who is responsible for the cooling tower. Uh, sometimes it could be a, uh, the project, uh, the property management, uh, it, it could be a tenant uh, who is the person who is the responsible party. Uh, you could have an office building and there's uh, different uh, tenants within that building and only one of the tenants uh, is the responsible party uh, for the cooling tower. So sometimes it's difficult um, just knowing who the responsible person is, even if you have the information about a cooling tower at the property so it does take some uh it, it does take some digging in there and some research to to finally be able to to evaluate all of those uh, those things uh property turnover and sales this is a huge one uh i'm not sure about where you're from but the austin market is really hot i think you all heard about the residential and how home values and trying to buy a home well, commercial is just the same. Uh, with commercial, uh, for this type of program, when it comes to commercial, we can be dealing with someone or uh, uh, you know talking to someone for a couple of years, and then all of a sudden they fall off the radar. Uh, and that building has either been sold, there's an investment group that now has it, um, there's a new management group that's, that's taken over. It could be a number of things. And now we need to, to kind of re-engage that, that property to find out who is now in control, who is the person that we need to get this information in front of, uh, and, and, and really start from uh, square one once again. Uh, so that's uh, property turnover and sales. That's, that's one of our issues that we have here. And honestly, one of the things that we learned uh, when we were implementing this program is that we did overlook a key stakeholder uh, when we started this. Uh, we did we didn't we didn't communicate with the commercial management uh, groups. Uh, and what we did, uh, the way that we actually started to engage them, well, we went to the Austin, well, we got a list of lists from the Austin Business Journal, the top 25 commercial uh, business management groups, and started to go directly to them to talk to them to let them know about our program, because the commercial management groups, they're the ones that's gonna be moving from place to place, or they may have multiple buildings within your municipality. Uh, and once we started talking to them, we also started getting even more, hey, 
uh, more communications like, hey, uh, I have such and such building, we got your information, do you have us in your program? Uh, no, can you register your cooling tower, submit it to me, and by the way, the inspection process, and started that conversation from that. And that uh, was able, we were able to do that when we started looking at that, uh, that issue of property turnover and sales and how we were gonna address that. Program awareness is another issue that we're having. The evaporative loss program has been around longer than the cooling tower efficiency program. If you go online and you Google uh, Austin cooling tower, the first thing that comes up is evaporative loss. And so uh, there is some confusion about where they send their information. Sometimes they want to package it uh, because we have two different um, uh, two different programs. And so we do have to do some or we've had to do some rebranding to kind of separate ourselves from them. And then timely submission from program uh, participants. That is another important one. Uh, our people uh, like to wait till the very last minute and then contact someone to come do their inspection and then try to get it in uh, before the deadline. And generally it's a little bit after the deadline. We're thinking, or I'm thinking that the compliance portion is really gonna clean this part up as we continue implementing the compliance program. Uh, some more program challenges. Many delegate cooling tower responsibility and they don't understand the operation and maintenance of the equipment. And this is where that conversation is really important as we're talking to them about cycles of concentration uh, and the water savings from running their equipment much more efficiently. Uh, I can talk about cooling towers for a while, but after five minutes, people's eyes just glaze over. Uh, I don't know, you're probably more familiar with, uh, the, with um, evaporative cooling than you think. If you get out of a swimming pool on a hot Texas day, that chill that you feel, that's evaporative cooling. That's that little bit of heat that's on the surface that's going into the atmosphere and cooling you down. That's all evaporative cooling is. That's what a cooling tower does. Again, I can talk about this for a long time, but there's a point where people just shut off. What we've realized, though, is if we give a good business case and let them know the reasons why this benefits you, then they start to listen. That's the thing that's going, that's the message that starts to bore in and uh, kind of opens up um, uh, their attention to us. And then there's an idea that lower cycles of concentration means better protection of cooling towers. If we lower the cycles of concentration, we won't have as much scaling or uh, other issues. Again, we had to talk to them about the purity of Austin water and that you can run it at five, six cycles of concentration, and it's not going to have an impact to your cooling tower because it still falls below those maximum values that are recommended. And we even looked at like BAC, that's another cooling tower to see what their uh, maximum values are uh, and others. And we still fall below six, uh, six cycles of concentration with just Austin water. So some lessons learned. It's critical to follow up with the cooling tower community and key stakeholders. Um, uh, that's uh, it's really important you have to also make yourself available to address issues you can send out emails we can send out uh, letters uh, we can have information on our web page but when it comes down to it the majority of people want to pick up a phone and they want to talk to you directly and so you really have to be available to uh, to talk to uh, individuals when they want to ask you about your program uh, when you need to talk to them about the uh, benefits uh, so it's a, it's a, a labor intensive program, uh, to be sure, uh, when you're getting involved in it. Uh, some other lesson, lessons learned is to work within your organization to find other cooling tower programs and, um, uh, start working with them. See what you can see, how the two of you can benefit one another, uh, Again, when we started this, there wasn't a forecasting tool to help us out. And so we really had to work within Austin Water to try to identify those cooling towers and it's a relationship that still helps us even now. Uh, and it's just growing as we continue to hear of other programs that are coming on board where they're gonna be dealing with cooling towers. Uh, we're one of the first ones to come up and say, hey, don't forget about us. We send your information over here because we need to put those on our list. 
And then another, the last lesson learned, well, there's a lot of lessons learned, but another one that I'm gonna identify here is create language that makes a business case for the program and various rebates and incentives. It's really important. I think as a compliance, pro, uh, as a compliance guy, and I've been doing compliance for a while, it's really easy to, to use that compliance as the motivator to get them to, to do, to, to implement the program. But ultimately, that's only part of it. Uh, you really have to be able to speak their language and make the case to them as well. And uh, that's going to do a lot in, in establishing the program. Okay, so I talked about the 2013 study that we did. Uh, uh, 2013, uh, recently, just uh, this last year, there was another in-house study where we actually want to look at this to see, is this really working? Are we being successful uh, in implementing the cooling tower program? Um, and uh, can we quantify uh, water savings? Uh, when, we, when we started this, when we started this program, the average cycle of concentration for a tower was 3.56. The um, median tower was about 449 tons. Uh, the average usage was 19,396.8 gallons per a day um, for a cooling tower. It's a, it's a significant amount of water. Uh, well, we started looking at the cooling towers within the program uh, and uh, we actually went to the evaporative loss because they had the most data when it came to cooling towers. Uh, we identified 120 cooling towers. Uh, 80 of those were compliant, meaning they uh, were able to achieve, when I'm talking about compliant here, I'm talking about five cycles of concentration. 40 of those were non-compliant. We looked at a span of January of 2013 through February of 2020, 86 months. We didn't include COVID because things got a little strange during COVID as people started working from home and, and things like that. But we still had a really good amount of data to look at. And what we came up with during this time is uh, we looked at commercial buildings where we have uh, uh, six parcels, we have industrial and uh, uh, office, uh, you see here the average cooling tower usage in gallons per day, the average parcel usage, because this program actually had the cooling towers metered, the uh, in and out of the cooling tower was metered, and then we could also look at the parcel in its entirety, and we were able to separate how much water the actual cooling tower was using, and then we were able to break that down into percentage, and as you can see, it's not it's not apples to apples. You know, your general commercial, it's 8.6% of its uh, water usage, but your office buildings, it's 40%. Um, your, your uh, you know, industrial is 25%. Uh, so if you're just looking at a place where you can maybe do some rebates and incentives uh, to, uh, to try to lower their water usage, you can start with office buildings and begin to communicate with them to try to get uh, uh, those efficiencies there uh, instead of somewhere like general commercial. Uh, it, it, it varies from, from parcel to parcel, but what we do see is that office buildings is uh, a place where we really wanna focus on. And again, it's why we were reaching out to the, uh, to the building management groups. Uh, overall, about 30% of parcel water is used for cooling tower use. That's on average, but again, it varies from, from one to the other. So for the cooling tower program, the weighted average for cooling tower savings uh, is about 1,520 gallons per day, assuming average weather conditions. During the peak month of uh, August, we actually had uh, 2,990 gallons per day of savings. Remember, this is from uh, reaching the five cycles of concentration, compliant, non-compliant, comparing the two. Uh, the uh, gallons per day savings in, in the hottest part of the month was 2,990. Uh, the estimated total program potential average and peak savings was 0.69 and 1.37 million gallons a day. Uh, this is based on current cooling tower inventory. Uh, remember previously what I had mentioned, we thought we were going to get 100 million gallons out of this. We're actually over double right now 
uh, with the cooling towers that are that we're tracking, and we still believe that there's many, many more of them out there. Uh, I say all of that just to say it's a it's a difficult program. Um, you're going to have bumps in the road. We've experienced many bumps in the road, but it is one of those programs that is worthwhile and it pays off, especially if you're looking for areas within the CII world to tackle some uh, efficiency, water efficiencies. Um, this is one of the good ones to, to get involved with. Thank you.